right. Hey, church. You guys heard the great news? We have a YouTube channel now. You guys seen this? Yes. Uh, the reason that's such great news is because it gives us a platform where you can uh, view content and share that content with your ones as you're praying for, for more people to know Jesus and you're praying for your ones and, and you have opportunities now to share even easier than ever before to say, hey, this is what I'm talking about. Here's a taste. Here's a, a flavor of that. And it's right there on YouTube, one of the most used platforms in the world. And so that's available to us. So make sure you subscribe subscribe and start playing around with that and using it. Yes, church is a great tool. Um, I am very excited about that as we're uploading more and more and more uh, videos and content there as I know it'll be a great resource for us. Uh, but one of the things I noticed, you know, when I was looking at YouTube was that there, there are all these influencers on YouTube. You guys seen this? There's, it's like, like people's profession. Like, what do you do for a living? Well, I'm an influencer. Really? That's really cool. What does that mean? And, and they're cultural influencers, so they're, they're doing things in their videos, whether it be pushing products or different things, and they're having an influence and an impact on culture. Well, I think that, you know, we have an opportunity, MCC, to really be an influencer in our culture, and we are. We really, really are. Now, particularly in the, in the church world, I want to speak to that for just a moment. Um, we are influencers, those of you who are praying for one, and you know the one thing we ask you to do at MCC, we always ask everybody what we ask you to do, pray for one. Now, we don't just say that as a slogan or a phrase, we actually do it. So right now, would you pray with me? God, please give me one person to share your love with. Let's pray that together out loud. God, please give me one person to share your love with. Well, that is a prayer that God answers and moves through, and it is influencing the church world as other churches are saying, wait a minute, what is that? How do, you, how do you do that? What does that mean? Could we do that? And so you are a part of something God is doing to influence and change the world. And I think that is a, a wonderful thing, and we want to share that more and more because it's true excellence. And we need that within the family of God and the kingdom of God, excellence. Now, when I say excellence, I want to define it for you. Excellence is doing the best you can with the resources you have available doing the best you can with the resources you have available. But I remember when I started out in church work, there was a phrase that would go around that would say, you know, we'd be doing a project or a job and we'd kind of get it up and it, you know, might be crooked and, you know, be on the church building, but we look at it and we go, eh, that's good enough for church work. And, you, you know, it's kind of like an uncomfortable laugh, but I just want you to think, if you've been around church, like sometimes when people go to make a donation to church, like, eh, that's good enough for church work. You know, it's not my best gift. It's not the best I could do. It's not even necessarily what I want to do, but it's good enough for church work. I remember back when, uh, you know, everybody had a, a PC at home, you know, the big tower computers and everything. You can't, you can't even begin to imagine how many of those we had stashed in closets at church. Because every time somebody got a new one, I'm going to give the church my old one. I mean, it's outdated and slow and not good enough for me to, you know, online shop, but it's good enough for church work. And that's kind of a, a thought we have, but we, within the church, within the family of God, we want to give God our absolute best. And when we say we want excellence, we want to do the best we can, the best job we possibly can with the resources we have available. The cool thing about that is, is if you're connected to God and you're doing his will and he is moving through you, you have all his resources. And so we have the potential for uh, excellence like the world has never seen before. So it's not a comparative excellence like we're looking around going, well, hey, you know, are we, are we doing better than other churches? Or, hey, are we doing better than, you know, this organization or, you know, this cultural movement? No, it's not that. It's what has God given us? What's he entrusted us with? And really when it comes down to he's entrusted us with his love. And we want to use his love and share his love in the most excellent way possible. And so today we wrap up our message series called Whatever, uh, and uh, by talking about thinking about what is excellent and praiseworthy. So we're going to put our memory verse up on the screen, and we're going to put a smile on our faces. Everybody online, you guys, right now, smile. Get off YouTube back here, and I want you to smile. And we're going to read this out loud together. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Can I get a woohoo for that? Yeah. Big woohoo. We want to think about such things. I got to tell you, this series, whatever, I, I find myself saying whatever, just like we all do, whatever, 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 whatever. And every time I do, it's like God says, hey, how about one of these things instead? How about one of these things in, in, instead? What is, what is excellent? What is praiseworthy? What is admirable? What is lovely? Whatever is true, whatever is pure, whatever is right, 
And it's such a, a wonderful gift that he's giving us to really grab those thoughts and not just have a whatever mindset, but let's, let's really pay attention to what we're thinking. So when it comes to thinking about excellence, right, we don't want to use excellence as an excuse not to do things. I've seen that before where people have said, well, I would, I would love to do this, but I can't do it with excellence, therefore I will not do it at all. God's given us a job to do, to share his love. And, and so sometimes we feel uh, very uh, insufficient for the task that he's given us to do as his church, to carry the mission of Jesus, to be a part of saving the world and sharing his love with everyone. But just because we are insufficient and lacking in so many ways, we need to remember he is not. And so the resources we have available to us are greater than we can ever imagine. And so let's think in terms of, okay, excellence is doing the best we can with the resources we have. And if God says to do it and it's good, we ought to do it with excellence. Because of this, doing good is excellent. Doing good is excellent. And so when God gives us something good to do or reveals something uh, good and positive and right, that is an excellent thing to do. And sometimes excellence really is that simple. Do the good you ought to do. Do the next good thing before you. In Titus chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, and then down in verse 8, it says this. Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and always be gentle toward everyone. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. And so there's a, a list of some things that are good. Now we know many other things that are good, but these things are excellent and profitable for everyone. So if we wanna, if we wanna think about what is excellent, doing good is excellent, all right? So what, what is it that, that is doing good? Well, first of all, if we understand that we are good, then we can be good. If you have a relationship with Jesus, then he has transformed you. You have a new identity. The old is gone, the new has come, he's changed your heart. And so if he has made you good, then be good. And so if you're gonna be good, be civil. Be civil, like it says here, uh, sub, be subject to rulers and authorities. So in that context, we're gonna, we're gonna be civil, we're gonna obey the, the laws. We're, we're not gonna throw people into confusion and create all kinds of silly arguments and foolish debate, debates and goofy controversies. And, and being civil and being subject to rulers and authorities, then it's things like, um, you know how people get so mad? I don't know if you, you've probably never done this. But like you, you've, you've broken a traffic law. I know, you've never done this, but let's just propose that maybe, maybe that one time you broke a traffic law. Now you didn't do it on purpose. You know, you just weren't paying attention. Well, no, that's not very good either. You're operating a very heavy vehicle at a very high rate of speed, not paying attention. I'm not too excited about that excuse. And one of the authorities stops you because you are doing something that is illegal and that law is there to protect us. Now, when this person is then correcting you and, and maybe um, issuing uh, a, a citation of some sort, that you're going to need to take care of at a future date, not too far in the future? Have you ever found yourself either under your breath or even out loud saying, why don't you go arrest the real criminals? <laughs> My tax dollars don't go to... <laughs> okay. You are the real criminal in this situation. There is a law, you have broken that law. So, you know, in those moments, instead of, you know, being upset and angry and mad, you know, because, well, I'm not like those people who break laws. Well, yes, you are. You just did. We, and so if there, you know, instead I might be thankful if there, if there wasn't a citation issued or if there was only a warning or maybe even just be thankful that I was pulled over because I wasn't paying attention. And now I'm going to be more alert. It's going to cost me some money, but I'm going to pay more attention and I'm going to be more alert. Be subject, right? So we're not gonna get upset and you know, lose our minds and, and say things that really don't make sense, that, that don't line up with what, who we are and what's going on. So we're gonna be civil. Uh, we wanna be good, then we'll also um, be prepared. And we'll be prepared to do good things. We wanna prepare and get ready so that when an opportunity comes, we're able to move in that. So as we're praying for one, we, we want to be prepared. We want to be able to give an answer for the reason for the hope that we have. If somebody asks a question, we want to be prepared with an answer. Right? We want to be prepared. So what if somebody asks you a question you don't know? Are you prepared for that answer? What is the answer to a question you don't know? What do you answer? 
I don't know, so you're prepared. Way to go. I would tell you right now, most Christians are not prepared to answer a question they don't know. They get answered to ask a question they don't know. They make something up. Stop it. Seriously, knock it off. Stop making up stuff. It's not helpful. It's not good. It throws everybody into confusion. Your, your preparation, because you're going to get asked things you don't know. I don't, I don't know. Be, be prepared. Um, and uh, also be obedient. And so if, if somebody has authority over you, then obey that authority and be respectful in that. Uh, be truthful. In other words, I'm going to really help you understand that one. Don't lie. Does that make sense? I know that's a tough one. Well, I mean, what do you mean by lie? I mean, like, tell the truth. Be, tr- be truthful in what you're doing. Um, this is excellence. To be excellent here is to be truthful. This is like having integrity. You can always tell, you know, how much somebody's integrity is wor- worth by, you know, at what point they're willing to lie. You know, your child is, is 12 and the cutoff, you know, for that movie ticket for the child is 11. You're, you're 11. No, I'm not. I'm 12. No. My integrity is worth exactly $1.75. <laughs> you will grow up into this. You're welcome. <laughs> you know, we, our integrity, you know, you can really see that. So be, be truthful and say, wait a minute, what am I doing here? Um, be peaceable. And <laughs> boy, can, can we use this? Everybody ready for some peaceable people? I know, I know you're, you're like, I'm a pot stirrer. That's my role in life. I stir the pot. I like to mix it up. We don't like it when you do that. <laughs> we really don't. That, could you stop, please? Be, be peaceable. Look for common ground. I mean, goodness, we fight and argue over things when we have so much common ground that we could celebrate and enjoy and actually um, enjoy relationships with one another instead of fighting over ridiculous things. Don't fall for those traps. They're horrible. Be peaceable. Um, also, uh, be considerate. Be aware of others around you and some of the things they're experiencing. You, you find a lot of this like in group speak sometimes, and it can certainly happen uh, within the context of the church where people start talking in a certain way, you know, like there's Christianese, some of the language we use, and you're, you're cutting people out. They don't understand the words you're saying. They don't know what you're talking about. It's like foreign to them. Or you start thinking, well, everybody here thinks the same way. And there are, there's somebody there who doesn't, where if you are aware of that or you took enough time to maybe care or really take stock of who was there, you wouldn't say the same things in the same way. And so you want to be considerate of people. Where are you coming from? Understand where somebody's coming from before you start, you know, unloading things on them so that you can speak to them in a way that's considerate. That's love. That's excellence. You can, you can share truth in an excellent way, but you can also share truth in a really damaging way. So be considerate with people. Um, be gentle. Be gentle with people. And I want you to look at these, right? We're, we're going to be good because we are good, because God is good, and he is recreating us in his image. And so if we're going to be good, let's be civil, be prepared, be obedient, be truthful, be peaceable, be considerate, be gentle. And let me, let me tell you, if we allow God to do this in us, we will be so much more effective in praying for one. Just imagine. So if you look at this list and if you're like, whoa, not doing a very good job there. Hadn't been paying attention to that. Not doing very good there, you know. Um, really not doing that great there. Then as we're praying for one, we're probably missing out on opportunities to really share God's love with excellence to the people that he is putting before us that he wants to love on through us. And so we want to do this with excellence. We want to pray for one and share God's love with excellence. And the reason for that is love is most excellent. So if we're gonna think about whatever is excellent, then let's think about love, because love is most excellent. Now, God is love, so when we're thinking about real love and and what that is, God is love, and so we're gonna think about him when we think about what is most excellent. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 13, it's oftentimes referred to as the love chapter of the Bible, but the whole Bible is a book of love, God expressing his love to us because he is love. But listen to these words. Verse uh, 31 of chapter 12 says, and yet I will show you the most excellent way. This is the most excellent way. And then he goes on, if I speak in the tongues of men and angels but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clinging cymbal. It's like I'm just a loud person making no impact. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith, 
that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and, uh, and give uh, over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it, it, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never what? Fails. It wins, it doesn't fail. But this is, this is the excellent love of God, who he is. This is, we are sharing him because God is love and he is the most excellent. Love is the most excellent way. Now, when I think about excellence, one of the things that I get to do just about every week is I get to preach like I am right now. And um, there's a lot of preparation that goes into this. You know, I was thinking about that, that list about being good, you know, preparing and uh, being obedient to God, being truthful, trying to be considerate and gentle. You know, all these things are really playing into what I, I hope God is communicating to us. But right before I come out to preach, every time, there's three things I pray. Every single time. And if you remember these three things, I'd love for you to pray them for me. Um, but the three things I pray is, God, love these people through me. Because love covers a multitude of sins. So even if the delivery is shaky and the content wasn't all that great or it was kind of confusing and it, maybe it didn't make sense and I didn't really, you know, bring it home and, it, you know, it wasn't the best I could, you know, God, your love is excellent and it is powerful you know, and when I'm weak, you're strong, God. It, love people through me. The second thing I pray is, God, give me something to say. Let what you want to be said be said and nothing else. God, you speak. Let there be a point here. Let, let people be able to hear from you. It's amazing. Sometimes people tell me um, what I preach. I love hearing what I preach because it's not what I said. <laughs> but sometimes there's a really powerful God truth in there because God is, is really speaking to people. So God, uh, give me a, a point, give me something to say. Please speak through me. And then the third thing I pray is, God, let me have fun. I, I just, I, don't underestimate the fun factor. Yeah, for real. I, my, my take on it is in this scenario right now, if I'm not having fun, nobody's having fun. <laughs> Unless you're getting like a good nap in or something. My, my voice can be a little shrill. It's not the best for napping. I'm aware of that. So let, let me have fun. Now, what I found is that when the love thing is in place and God is, is loving people and, oh, and, and when, you know, I've prepared and worked and he is speaking, this is the most fun I have in my life. But it, it's not just preaching. It's living. It's every day. What do you What do you do? Like if, if everything you do, you really started saying, I want to do this with excellence to glorify God. God, whoever I get to encounter today, uh, Lord, love them through me. I and mean, that's what we're doing when we pray for one. God, let, let my efforts and my work and my energy and, and the things I'm doing today, uh, let them reveal who you are to other people. Let my life have a point today. And God, let me have fun. I, I'm going to tell you right there, this is excellent. Because love is excellent. This is the most excellent way. And there's all these things that we can do that seem so important. Maybe you're a YouTube influencer. Way to go. <laughs> Way to go. They seem so, so big. Maybe you're, maybe you're a big deal. Maybe sometimes you, you feel like you're, you're nothing. None of those things matter. God longs to use you and for his love to move through you. And so we can speak in tongues, we can prophesy, and we can have faith that moves mountains. We can be the smartest people ever. But without love, it's just meaningless. But then we have that beautiful definition of love in 1 Corinthians 13, beginning in verse four, where we're told that love is patient. Now, if God is love, I, I just want you to, to think about that. that means God is patient. Then it says love is kind. That means that God is kind. 
Love does not envy. That means God does not envy. It does not boast. That means that, that God is not boastful. It is not proud. So it means God is not proud. Love does not dishonor others. So God is honorable. It is not self-seeking. So God is not selfish. It is not easily angered. So God doesn't fly off the handle. Love keeps no record of wrongs. God does not keep score. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. Love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. God never fails. And so as you, you look at all these words there, this is a picture of who God is, patient, kind, doesn't keep score, he trusts, uh, hopes. This is the gift that he gives us in his love. And then we are recreated in the image of God, so God is the I am. This is his name. So he could easily say this. Can you just, you, if you could hear God saying to you, hey, you want to know who I am? Here's who I am. I am love, so I am patient. So you need to hear that God is patient. Look at these words, and, and what is God saying to you about who he is? And then what's powerful about that is if you have a relationship with Jesus and he transforms and changes your heart, not only is this who God is, but he is recreating you in his image, and his love is in you and moving through you. And when we pray for one, that's what we're asking God to do, that we are tapping into his love, this love that is unstopping, unfailing, it never ends. It is limitless moving through us. What if you could say this about you? What if you could say that about you? What if you could say, you know what, I am patient. When we think about excellence, we make all kinds of excuses. We're, we don't do something, that, we're not excellent in our relationships because we fly off the handle. It's because I'm easily angered. I, you know, I have a temper problem. Not if God's love is in you, transforming you. That's not who you are. I am not easily angered. I am patient. You see, you start having a, a re-identification of self by looking at yourself through God's eyes, the, the eyes of love and who he declares that you are, an object of his love, and, and now being transformed by that. You can say, oh, I am patient. I am kind. I am not envious. I am not boastful. I am not proud. I am honorable. I am not selfish. I'm not easily angered. I don't keep score. You know what I mean by keeping score, right? We do this in relationships all the time. That's why we get revenge and we gotta pay people back and we gotta take it a step further and that's why our relationships are so terrible because we're always keeping score. I don't delight in evil. I rejoice with the truth. I protect. I trust. I hope. I persevere. And then I won't fail. And so as you, as you look at your life and excellence as we do this, you, you might look at who God is and who we are in light of him. And what is he trying to say to you? Is there one of these that really pops out today? Or maybe a, a takeaway right now for you is to just to start saying, you know what? I am patient. I am patient. That is excellent right there. That is excellent. So we're told to, Think about what is excellent, and then also think about what is praiseworthy. What is praise? What is worthy of your praise? Now, love is clearly worthy of our praise. God is, of course, worthy of our praise. Those are obvious things. But what is worthy of our praise? Because we are designed to give praise. We're just, it's, in our, it's who we are. We're designed to do it. And if that praise is misdirected, then it's going to lead us into all kinds of places we don't really want to go. So pay attention to what you praise. Pay, pay real close attention to them. What, what is it that you worship? What captivates your heart? What are you longing for? What are you pursuing? What are you exalting? Worship and praise means, uh, worship means to exalt, to lift up, to say, you're greater than me. And so whatever you worship, whatever you praise, whatever you exalt over yourself, this is what you're going to spend your life pursuing, trying to, to gain. Now we can depend on those YouTube influencers to tell us what is praiseworthy. Or we could accept that God is the most praiseworthy. No doubt about it. In Romans chapter 1, verse 25, 
It says they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised, amen. And that text right there, it, it's so clear that, you know, that, that when we take our eyes off of God, the God of love who is praiseworthy, and, and then we take the adoration and the worship and the praise and the exalting that is due to him and we put it somewhere else, we're exchanging the truth of God for a lie and oftentimes we're doing it willfully. Here is this truth that we know, but instead of embracing that, we choose a lie over the truth. And we serve created things rather than the creator. Why do we do that? Well, because we can manipulate created things. We can bend them to our will. That's like when we, when we pray. Uh, sometimes... <laughs> I start to wonder, are we really praying and trying to talk to God and connect to the heartbeat of God? Or are we trying to make a new God? You know, the, the God that's like the little genie in the sky. We've got our own little Aladdin. Rub him in just the right way. Then he'll appear and grant me my, my wishes. Do this, do this. Well, who's the master in that scenario? And if we're, if we're constantly, if our prayers are really all about, God, I'm trying to conform you to my will instead of me being conformed to yours, we have misdirected praise. God, I need you to do this. God, I'm going to need you to take care of that. God, I need you to make these three things happen. God, I'm really disappointed in you. I thought we had a deal here. You were supposed to do this. And you, you dropped the ball again on this one. That's going to go in your, your permanent file as I keep score. And it, it reveals like a, a real lordship God issue there. And when we exchange the truth of God for a lie, then we worship and serve created things. And really, it's just in the image of ourselves. And so pay attention to what you praise because God is the most praiseworthy. God is the most praiseworthy. Now, there's, there's many things. I, when I, I left my house uh, early one morning this week, and the sun had just come up a little bit before, and I looked down my road, and I saw a deer crossing the, the road, and it, like, it caught my breath. It's not like the first time I've ever seen this, but you know when you see that you weren't expecting it, and you go, ah, oh, that is a praiseworthy moment. But I know who I'm praising. There, there is a God who created this world, who, who created the sunrise and the colors and the relationships and the people and the beauty, and there is order and there is purpose. He is the most praiseworthy. So anything like that that I encounter or see that, you know, is worthy of my praise, I know if you keep going up the ladder, you get to the one, the one who is the most praiseworthy. Psalm 145 verse 3 says, great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. I want you to read that out loud with me. You ready? Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. Yeah. Uh, you can stop there. It's like, a, it's like a little game of follow the leader here, you know. <laughs> or you can keep reading. I don't care. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. And I will meditate on your wonderful works they tell of the power of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. And I, I yeah, it's a woohoo for sure. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. Like we, we're just scratching the surface. Every time we catch a glimpse of his greatness, like whether it be a deer or a sunrise or um, a, a, a beautiful moment in a relationship, in these moments, these holy moments, we're just getting a glimpse of his greatness that we can't fathom. But it's like he keeps saying, hey, look, hey, look. And he shows himself to us and, and, and he captivates us and he grabs our, our hearts because he is most worthy of praise. And so how do, we, how do I praise God? Like, how do you do that? Well, right there in the text, there's a, a few things to do. First of all, think about him. Think about God. 
Think about his wonderful works. Think about who he is and, and what he's done. Take some time and just start saying, all right, uh, this is who you are, God. You are my savior. You are my friend. You are my redeemer. You are the holy one. You are righteous, God. You are good. You are love. You are pure. You are perfect. You are mighty, God. You are able. You are the greatest. There is no one greater. Uh, you could just go on and on. Think about him. Because when we take our, our minds off of God and we get our minds on all these problems and all these issues and all our worries and all our fears and all our doubts, he's like, hey, get your mind on me. Look up. We're so busy looking down and all around and, and in the muck and, and all the nastiness. He's like, hey, chin up, get, look at me. Exalt me, look up. Look at what I'm doing, look at who I am. Do you not know what I, what I can do? Are you not understanding this? Look, and I will show you. Think about God. That's one way to praise him. Then share him. Why? Well, how, do how do I share him? You just talk about him. You just talk about him. Like right now, think about God. Everybody, online, everybody, think about God right now. Think about him. Think about him. Now turn to someone quickly and say what you thought about. Real fast, like one or two words, go. If nobody's looking at you, you can shout it at me. You see, you all just shared him with somebody else. You just shared him with somebody else. That's a way of, of praising him, of lifting him up. Um, celebrate him. Celebrate him. Hey, um, you, you guys know how to celebrate, right? Yeah, <laughs> but if we're going to celebrate, don't we want to celebrate in an excellent way? All right, so if you feel like God has ever done anything praiseworthy, and you just thought about something that was praiseworthy about God, and if he was here right now, and right here in front of us, which he is, how would you celebrate that? Maybe a standing ovation? That's not a standing ovation. That's, would you not? Why wouldn't you? Look up. Celebrate him. Man. Yeah. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. Celebrate him. I don't, do we really think that we're celebrating him by, well, I'm being refined in my worship. Okay. Uh, uh, I don't, how's, I just, how's God being revealed through that? God, you, you did it. You're amazing. I mean, you know, I'm sure the Patriots love, would love to have a home crowd that sat on their hands and didn't celebrate anything good they did. I have a home field advantage. We have the quietest fans in the league. <laughs> That's no good. Let's celebrate him. He's revealed through that. Uh, and then it also tells us to, to sing about him. There's something powerful about singing. One of the things is that we can join our voices together. So we can, we can make noise, we can celebrate together, that's one way. We can talk, you know, but we're saying different things and sharing. But one of the ways that we can join our voices together as the church, which is really the beauty of praying for one, is that it's not just a one-on-one -on -one deal. This is the whole church coming together to share his love. Guys, this is excellent to lift our voices and sing and worship him. And so right now we're going to share in a time of communion. And during this, this communion time, um, the God who is most worthy of praise whose love is excellent, who has shown us the most excellent way, the way of love, and called us to be a part of his family. He's offering himself to you. And so when these trays come by, don't let this invitation pass you by. Take the bread, take the juice. Hold on to that until we've all been served. And after we've all been served, we'll eat and drink together. But the bread reminds us of how Jesus' body was broken for us. And the cup is a reminder of the new promise, the new relationship that he makes with us. Take the bread, take the juice. And then as you hold them, think about this most excellent way, this way of love. And would you pray, God, give me one person to share your love with. And then as you do that, lift up your eyes to the one who is worthy of praise, most worthy of praise and say, God, let me get another glimpse right now. 
Just let me get another glimpse right now. And then after we eat and drink together and when we close this service out with one more song, let's join our voices together to the one who is most worthy of praise. I'm gonna pray for us. Father, we thank you that you are most worthy of praise and that your love is excellent. Lord, thank you for this excellent, praiseworthy invitation. Lord, help us to hear from you right now, to listen to you, and to exalt you. And we ask for that in Jesus' name.